Of what we learn from the book itself on the different issues around research practice, knowledge gaps, and policy, and policy implications. So let me do that. So this book, um, as, 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 as I mentioned, um, is about the movement of anyone, an individual, or worker, or a group, from a lower to high level education, occupation, or, or social class or income. You notice right away that we are very key to capture occupational mobility. Uh, Shiko in his keynote today so talked about education income. We do believe the occupational mobility is also very important. And she also have occupational mobility along with income education, understanding social mobility. So the book contains 16 chapters. I will to show you what the chapters are uh, by top scholars in sociology, economics, political science, history, and anthropology. When Vegard, Iverson, uh, Ed, uh, Anirudh Krishnan and I put this book together, we are absolutely clear that we had to have a multidisciplinary conversation. It wasn't going to be a book only by economists, for economists, of economists. So we looked around and we found some of the leading scholars in other disciplines, and I think that's a very important part of what we did in this book. So just to give you a summary of the chapters, so apart from the introductory chapter, we have the book is in four parts. The first part is on the theory and concepts of mobility. We had, uh, an, in fact, we'll have a presentation passage back to show on, the, on chapter two, Drivers of Mobility in Global South. We had also had Gary Fields, Vega Davis, and Ravi Kanbu talking about the measurement problems and mobility, applying it to low-income low -income context. And then this, this part three is very important because we wanted to have chapters on income mobility, educational mobility, and occupational mobility. And so we had Himangshu and Peter Langer on the income mobility chapter, but you notice that Faris Itoche is perhaps one of the leading sociologists working on mobility, uh, on, especially in Latin America. She did the chapter on educational mobility, and then we had two sociologists, uh, Anthony Heath and Yizeng Zhao, did the chapter on occupational mobility. So again, we tried to make sure that we had the people of different disciplines speak about the kind of, with the kind of areas that they have been working on, and not just income, but education and occupation too. The third chapter, the third part, is where we brought these disciplines to speak to each other. So we had a chapter, the Shahi Imran for Rashid people present today, for, for Rashid people present today, on economics, how economists approach mobility. And then along with that, we had Yao Jin Li, a sociologist, speaking about how sociologists approach mobility using China as an example. And then we had uh, an anthropologist, the Yevait, uh, tell us how ethnographers will use, look at mobility using, uh, using quality methods. And finally, we had an economic historian, Gregory Clark, speak about how historians approach mobility using archival data. The, the fifth part was a, with the part where we talked about the drivers of mobility. We had Jerry Berman on human capital, uh, Emily Rains on Christian urban urbanization and on mobility. Nancy Look, a chapter which we thought was very important, have on gender and mobility. Uh, Patricia Wunji Gretchen Kisselquist, uh, who's Gretchen is my colleague in Wider, Uni Wider, on social mobility, horizontal inequality, Anand Imani and Emma Riley on social networks, and then we had this final chapter, the concluding chapter. So that's a stru that was a structure. So now let me just tell you a little bit, I'm just going to skip a couple of slides here. I'm going to just talk a little bit about the, what have we learned from this book. And I'm going to speak about three different areas. I'm going to speak about knowledge gaps, research practice, and policy options. And, uh, and this is really what, we t what was the reason why we got this book together, put this book together. First is that, what, do we, what are we not, still not very clear about, especially for low-income countries? So what are the important knowledge gaps that are there, and how can we try and address them? The second was on trying to think about research practice, methods, interdisciplinary inter inter conversations. So how can we try and have more innovative methods in looking at social mobility from different disciplines? And the final uh, part was to think about policy advice, and how should, we, how, should we, how should we advise policymakers who think of social mobility in their own country context? So that was the way we thought about what the, what the book should be about, and the final chapter sort of does that in, dif in, different, in different ways. So knowledge gaps. Um, I think the first thing we, we felt, and that's something Shiko mentioned in the keynote, is that we don't really have the data that we need to understand mobility, international mobility. What we need is data on going back in time or income, education, occup uh, occupation, that can link parent, pa parents and children together. And we don't really have that. We don't have the kind of data that Raj Chetty and others are working with in the US, for example. So that's a really big problem. And it's something that we need to think about. Why are we still in a situation where we haven't got the panels that we need to understand mobility? Um, along with that, there were also questions about measurement. 
and I'll get back to that a little bit later, on how should we think about measuring mobility in a, co in a co context where perhaps income is not the best metric of mobility. So education and occupation may well be much more uh, better indicators of mobility when income is not exactly very reliable in low-income countries. A second gap we felt was very important is that there's practically almost no work on gender and mobility. So if you, can, if you ask a question that on mobility and father-son mobility in low- and middle-income countries, you might be able to say something, because there are a few papers in China and India and, and, and Latin America, but because mother-daughter mobility is practically nothing. Now, part of the reason is that, that many of the surveys we, we tend to look at do not ask questions about mothers, uh, about the, of, the, of the house or the, or the, person, the child, child's mother maternal background. It doesn't ask questions about the mother's educational background, occupational background, and so on. So we don't really have the kind of question, the kind of data we need to understand mother-daughter mobility. But this is quite, quite disappointing because first it's just one-sided. I mean, you can't have a, so a consistent approach to mobility if you look at only father-son mobility and not look at mother-daughter mobility. And also when we know that women are now increasing into the labor force and increasingly getting educated. So that's a big, big gap that we found in, in this literature. A third knowledge gap is that we don't really know much about the drivers of mobility. So if you look at the work, the causal evidence on this, it's still pretty limited. We don't really have the kind of work we've seen in the US and, and, and the European countries. So for example, if you think about somebody born, a poor child born in Islam in Mumbai, Nairobi, or Rio, there may be many things happen at the same time that can explain weak intergenerational mobility. It could be poor schooling, lack of well-paid jobs, a scarcity of role models in the neighborhood, and various forms of group-based discrimination. Now, which one exactly is more important? How do we know that for this child in, this, in, in, in Mumbai, in Arabia, Rio, is it to do with poor schooling? Is it to do with discrimination? Is it to do neighborhood effects? How do we disentangle these things? And I think one of the problems that I think is there in the economics approach is using experimental methods to cause experimental methods, we try and isolate one factor, one key factor. But of course, that's not really what happens when we, when we see complex interactive causes of mobility in this kind of, in this kind of country context. So how do we bring together our understanding of both the causal evidence, which in, which we, in which in any case is quite limited, along with evidence from qualitative, me qualitative methods which can tell us more about the multiple causes of mobility. So that's something that's a big, that's a big limitation there. On research practice, we think there are three key lessons. First lesson I think we think is that there is a problem that if you ask someone that what is mobility in China in education, let's say, or occupation versus India, it's very difficult to get a clear answer. Why? Because the person working on China is using one concept of mobility, the person working in India is using a different concept of mobility. Concepts are used in a loose way. Measurement is done in a fairly ad hoc way. So, that, so for example, so apart from perhaps Chicago or education mobility, where there's a more clarity of how you measure education, education achievement, perhaps, though not on quality of education, but more educational attainment, there's very little we can do on income mobility because measurement and concepts often seem to be going at, at uh, are often contradicting each other. And I think that's something to think about, that if, you, if you're going to work on mobility, exactly be clear about your concepts. Define your concepts, define your measures at the very beginning. So, so that's one very big, very big problem. The other problem I think we think is that the measures and methods we use often are not really capturing what you really want to capture. So if you think about IGRCs, IGMs, we seem to think mobility upward or, or downward is symmetrical. So for example, if you move up, the same thing as you move down. The IGRC does not differentiate between upward or down, down mobility. But downward mobility in Africa or South Asia, in low-income context, is a very different situation than upward mobility. So we can't use measures which are, cap which are capturing mobility in, in upward or downward mobility in symmetrical ways, when, because that's not really very useful. So we need to find better ways to capture mobility, which does seem to take into account the difference between upward and downward mobility. And that's something, again, we need to think about. Um, the third thing we, feel, we felt was that there needs to be these conversations that hasn't happened in the literature. We have to have conversations between economists, historians, sociologists, political scientists, uh, anthropologists, because that will make this work much richer. And I think that's something that we wanted to take to the economists uh, who work in this area, that 
it's really important that they need to engage with the non-economic literature. Especially in sociology, where there's a lot of work going on on quantitative sociology and mobility, there needs to be much better conversation going on between those who even who use quantitative methods on mobility, mobility concepts and measures. So that's something we felt was very important. On policy, I think, what the, I think the first few policy options we thought came out of the, of the book itself are fairly standard. We, talked, we, we, got, we saw a lot of evidence on the importance of broad-based human capital investment. There's very clear evidence that we need to have more jobs, good jobs and with opportunities for people to move up, occupation and income. Uh, we also a lot of, saw clear evidence that downward mobility is not something we should have in a low-income country context. So we should really worry about downward mobility before even thinking about upward mobility and find ways to try and make sure that that downward mobility is contained. So that's something else that we found. But there were other things that came out from the, from the, from the volume that we felt were not exactly being discussed as much in the policy literature. One was that we felt social networks make a big difference in low-income country context. So who you know, how do you, peer, peer effects, neighborhood effects, all these are very important. And the chapter by Emma uh, Riley and, 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 um, uh, and, um, and Mani show the, the importance of social networks very, very clearly. So for example, how do we get information jobs, referrals, intangible uh, ways by influencing aspirations, cultural capital, providing role models are really important in thinking of mobility. 